Well, Mom, our teacher told us how God sent Moses behind enemy lines on a rescue mission to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. When he got to the Red Sea, he had his engineers build a pontoon bridge, and all the people walked across safely. Then he used his walkie-talkie to radio headquarters for reinforcements. They sent bombers to blow up the bridge, and all the Israelites were saved. Now, Johnny, is that really what your teacher taught you, his mother asked. Well, no, but if I told you the way the teacher did, you'd never believe it, and you'd probably fall asleep. <laughs> now, <laughs> number one, don't fall asleep today. Uh, number two, you could take this little storyline and you can apply this any way you want. But how I want us to see this particular little story is this way. God does things so differently than we can imagine. Think about it. Moses, raise up your stick. Raise up your, your staff. I'm going to part the sea with a staff in your hand. I'm going to have wall of water on all the, both sides. You're going to walk across on dry ground. You're going to get all the way across. And I'm going, to de- I'm going to deliver you. And I'm going to destroy the enemy who chases you. Who would have ever thought that by raising the staff, we would see such a miraculous thing take place. And yet, that's how God chooses to work at times. In ways that we would not concoct. In ways that we wouldn't think God would do it. But then that's exactly how God would do it. I've entitled the message today, Let God Be God. In Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 5 it says, I am the Lord and there is no God but me. I will equip you for battle though you have not known me. Even though there isn't all there is, even though we don't know all there is about God, how magnificent, how great and and, and wonderful he may be, while we don't even have a clue how grandiose God is, it doesn't stop God from fighting our battles. It doesn't stop God from being who God is. It doesn't stop God from doing what God does. I want to read a few scriptures to you from Proverbs, and I want you to think about what they're saying. How we might uh, apply this thought today. I'm going to start with Proverbs, the first four verses of chapter 16. It says, we can make our own plans, but, say but, but the Lord gives the right answer. People may be pure in their own eyes, but, say but, But the Lord examines their motives. Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. Commit your actions to the Lord and your plans will succeed. I I believe what that implies is that as I walk in obedience to the Lord and submit to him on a daily, regular basis, that in doing that, I, I am enhancing the opportunity of falling right into naturally what his plan is for my life. Because I'm walking in obedience to his word. Here's verse 4. The Lord has made everything for his own purposes, even the wicked for the day of disaster. Listen to this verse. The Lord has made everything for his own purposes, even the wicked for the day of disaster. Listen carefully one more time. And think about what went on in the news this week in America. Listen carefully to these words. If you believe the Bible is real today, then listen carefully. The Lord has made everything for his own purposes, even the wicked 
for a day of disaster. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you today that God knows exactly what he's doing in America. He knows exactly what's going on. You know, Scripture didn't say all good things work together for good, did it? It said all things work together for good. That means we include the not so good and the good. All things work together for good. In fact, I sent a list to my family a while back, 10 plus things that, and I don't want to upset you, I don't want to throw you off, I don't want to confuse you today, but I sent a list, 10 plus things to all of my family, to all my family members, uh, a while back, of 10 plus things, good things that have come out of this pandemic. You think, well, Pastor, how can anything good come out of this? There's been some very sad things. But there's been some very good things because all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, to those who know the Lord, to those who are called according to his purpose. We'll see that develop. Proverbs 16, verse 9. We can make our plans, but, say but, but the Lord determines our steps. Once again, I want to say something. We can make all the plans in the world we want, but if those plans don't include God, then the Lord may redirect some of our steps because if we desire to know him, if we desire to trust him, if we desire to be in his will, he's going to rearrange our life and rearrange our steps so that we are walking in his steps. So he determines our steps. But we have to be willing to walk in obedience. Then Proverbs 14, 12 says this. There is a path before each person that seems right. But, come on, one more time. But it ends in death. There is a path before each person that seems right. In other words, there can be those things in life that we believe are just as the right thing for us. But they can end up in death. They can lead to spiritual death. And ultimate death. You see, these scriptures imply that our ability is going to come from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Our ability to get through, our ability to succeed, our ability to get and to endure the times in which we live is going to come from the Lord. That we should always approach God on the basis of what is God's will for my life. What is God's will for my life? My life. Your life. What is God's will? Not my will, but your will, dear Lord. You see, here's our foundation. With, and here's our foundation of God. And it's our, our takeaway, our chief main takeaway for today. I'm going to give it to you now. Our chief main takeaway. There's others you'll see online Post the message today. Go online and check that out. But I'm going to give you the ultimate of my takeaway for today. It's three things. Number one, God knows all. He's omniscient. God knows the best way. And number three, and this is as beautiful as the first two. God knows the outcome. God already knows the outcome. He already knows the end result, ladies and gentlemen, of all that ever happened, is happening, and will happen in history, all at the same time. And, ready for this? In all of our individual situations that we will ever go through, that I have been through, that I am going through, or will go through in the future, God knows it all. He knows the best way, and he knows the end result of all of that. So I want to get technical with you today. I want to break English protocol. And I'm going to just do hair-splitting semantic warfare with two words. 
I want to get technical on defining words today. And I want you to follow with me and allow me the latitude of just going off here. I want to speak to you today on waiting before God versus waiting on God. Waiting before God versus waiting on God. Because I personally believe there's a difference between the two. That's where I'm going to do some hair splitting with you English, English majors and word people. So following church today, you, well, you folks may go to a restaurant, let's say. So when you go to the restaurant, you sit down and all of a sudden... The waitress or waiter comes in and starts serving you food. Starts waiting upon you and puts all this food and the drink on the table. You look at the server and you're wondering, what in the world are they doing? What are you doing waiting on me? I didn't order this. What are you doing? I don't want a cheeseburger and french fries. I got to have a salad instead. I, I, and... This server starts serving you all this food. And you're wondering, well, what? I don't get this. As opposed to a waitress coming or a waiter coming to your table and standing there with a pad and pencil and saying, may I help you? And you sit before them and you peruse the menu and you start asking questions like, well, what do you, do you recommend here? I've never been here before. How are your salads good? Or do you recommend cheeseburger and french fries? What do you recommend? I've never been here before. And you, and you dialogue and you're communicating. You're sitting before the server. The server is standing before you. And you're having this conversation and you're ordering your food. Well, you go ahead and you take time. You order your food. And a few minutes later, here comes your food. And it's what you've ordered. It's exactly what you ordered. And they check on you and they begin to serve you. They're waiting on you through this whole ordeal. Now I want you to take this principle and I want you to apply it to a spiritual sense. There's certainly nothing wrong with going out of here today and waiting on God. There's certainly nothing wrong with going out and doing your business for the Lord, your daily life, and doing things for the Lord, and ministry for the Lord, and taking care of your family, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, going to work, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, doing all that we're supposed to do, waiting on God that way. But if, if I never stop to wait before the Lord, I'm missing out on how to better and how to more effectively wait on the Lord in serving God. Let me give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. You have Moses who had two experiences with 40 days and 40 nights getting the Ten Commandments. Where God set Moses aside to work with Moses and prepare Moses. There was that time, I think, for what, 40 years he was in, in the backside of the desert after he killed that one man. Didn't come back on the scene, what, for 40 years? Two different times, it's 40 days and 40 nights in the mountain. We read about Jesus. He had 40 days in the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan three different times. Where he was in preparation for ministry. We read about Paul. He had three years in the backside of the desert, if you recall. Years of preparation. You have Mordecai and Esther... For three days they fasted and prayed. For three days they fasted and prayed. Before she would go to the king. Because she knew that if she went to the king. And he didn't extend that scepter. She would, she would die. She could die. So she, they had, she had Mordecai and the people wait. For three days and three nights fasted and prayed. So that when they approached the king. She would be given the extension of that scepter. And she was. And God spared Israel that day. You think about Job. Oh my, here's Job, the man, the most righteous man in all the east. Yet throughout the book of Job, and I'm finishing up with the book of Job, my devotions today. And, and we read about Job's life and all this venom and all this stuff came out of him. And you think, well, wait a minute, how can he be the most righteous man in all the earth? Yet all this stuff came out of him. Well, because number one, he wasn't perfect. 
wasn't in an absolute perfect state. He was just the most righteous man of that time. Imagine how things must have really been then. But during this time of convalescing, spiritual convalescing and going on in his life, the stuff came out of him. And what God did was he refined him to become even a better man. And so we, we see these characters in the Bible where they were set aside for a time of preparation. They are set aside before God where they could be dealt with and God could deal with them. God could prepare them. In fact, the, the number 40 in Scripture signifies, if, if you look this up and check me out, I think you'll find that the number 40 in the Scripture signifies a period of trial, a period of testing, a period of probation. It's a period of preparation. That's what 40 represented in the Bible. So when you see these examples of 40, or when Paul was in the desert for three years, or Job and his ordeal, when you when Mordecai and Esther for three days, these are days and these are times of preparation. You don't go to a restaurant and they just bring you what they want. You go to a restaurant and you, you wait before the server to get what you want. Ladies and gentlemen, we come before God today and we learn to spend time with the Lord. We learn to take time. We learn to let life stop. So we can spend some time with God who knows all, who knows the best plan, and he knows the end result. Why would we think we could trust anything else better? Who do we think we could trust better, folks? Who? There are so many different stories out there. There's so many different facts. There's so many different visions and things out there. So there's so much going on out there. Honey, if you don't have the word, we have nothing. If we don't have God, we have nothing to go on. If we're going to let God be God, then we will have to wait. Before God, stop what we are doing and start listening. You see, because of our instant everything society, we've lost what I call the art. We've lost the art of listening. We've lost the art of waiting. We've lost the art, spiritual art now I'm speaking of. The spiritual art of sitting before the, and in the presence of God. We want answers now. Hey, just out of curiosity, let's uh, let's check the the weather here. Let me do something. Let's check the weather in Japan. Seventy-five degrees. I got it that fast. Look it up. I just got it. I just typed in. Before I walked out here, I had it typed in to say, because, you know, it's so small print, I could be typing. You know how spell check goes? You could be typing something from Ouagadougou, Africa, and wouldn't know it. So I had it already pre-typed, and all I had to do was push go, and within less than a second, the temperature is 75 degrees in Tokyo, Japan right now. Now, let's compare that with something. Do you remember the days that you would go to the library and you'd walk up to the library and you'd say, hey, I need to get a book on um, rockets. I'm doing an assignment for school. Well, young man, right over there in that catalog box is over there. Do you see all those boxes? If you will go over there and you just pull out the right letter of the alphabet, rockets pulled out and start figuring through, you'll find all kinds of books on rockets. Huh. Now, do you remember the days you'd go to the library? I do. And you'd be fingering through those cards. You'd take the card, you'd walk down the aisle, you'd find the book, you'd take the book off the shelf, you'd read a little bit about the book. I did that one day and read a book on the top 10 companies in America, why they were so successful. And then I was able to take the book, put it back on the rack and everything else. Whereas today, by the way, the librarian, wouldn't go get the book for us because they wanted us to learn how to do it. But look at all the time that took. Today I can just type that in, get the top ten companies, bada bing, bada boom. 
I don't have to go to the library and pull out those cards anymore. You see, folks, we live in this instant society, and we, I'm afraid that we transferred this desire to have this instantism from God, that we want this answer now. We want it all, and we want it now. Now, we serve an instant God, but we don't have a God that necessarily responds instantly. Because while we want answers now, ready for this? God wants our attention. God wants our time. And I apologize. I see some of you folks are fanning. We are having air condition problems today. Sorry about that. Just I saw you fanning. I want to explain that to you. You see, we want answers now, but God wants our attention. So let's examine the importance of waiting before God. All right? Let's, let's examine that. I want to take us to a storyline in Judges 20. Judges 20. I want to take a look at three prayer meetings, three times of prayer approaching God. In this particular story, it's the story of all the other tribes coming against the Benjamites because of a gross sin that the Benjamites, some Benjamite men committed against a Levite's concubine. Now, in Bible days, God did not ordain that these people have concubines. They just did it. That was disobedience. A concubine was a lady who was, I call, the assistant wife. She wasn't the original wife of the gentleman, but was an assistant wife, was an extra wife, if you please. Trying to be very delicate. I don't know all children who are listening today, trying to be very delicate here. And so uh, he thrusts his concubine out to these men uh, who want to do some bad things to this Levite and uh, who was a guest in the town he was in, Benjamite town. And uh, so they abuse this woman all night long. When he realizes the next morning that she has died, he takes her and he dismembers her body, sends it out to the rest of the tribes, and says, what are we going to do about this to the Benjamites who did this to my concubine? And so they rise, raise up this army to come against the Benjamites. And the Benjamites refused to turn over these few men who had committed this heinous act to this lady. Now, during this time, there are two types of things going on. We have the sin of the Israelites for walking in disobedience, being talked about in chapter 19. And then you've got the, dis, the, apost, the apostasy of the Benjamites who have just totally turned their back on God. And these men did this horrific thing and the rest of the city would not release these men to be judged and taken care of properly. So there's this apostasy to see of the Benjamites, and there's a disobedience of the Israelites. So God's got his hands full with his people. And so the rest of the nations are coming up, uh, the tribes are coming up against Benjamite, and so they go to the Lord, and we pick up in verse 18. It says, before the battle, the Israelites went to Bethel and asked God, which tribe should go first to attack the people of Benjamin? And the Lord answered, Judah is to go first. So the Israelites left early the next morning and camped near Gibeah. Then they advanced toward Gibeah to attack the men of Benjamin. But Benjamin's warriors who were defending the town came out and killed 22,000 on the battlefield that day. Hmm. Well, that's very interesting. They were told Judah was to go first. Judah goes first. 22,000 Israelites were killed. But let's, let's continue to be hair splitting today, shall we? Did you notice that God didn't say when to go? All God said was Judah is to go first. He didn't say when. So nothing is said about preparation. They don't ask God, what is the preparation? You know, in other stories in the Bible, they, they knew what the preparation was, or they would, they, would, they would want details. 
well, let's go to the second day. But the Israelites encouraged each other and took up possessions again at the same place they had fought the previous day. For they had gone up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord until evening. Okay. This isn't the server coming and doing and serving. This is them taking time now, isn't it? Taking time, weeping before God. They had asked the Lord, should we fight against the relatives from Benjamin again? And the Lord said, go out and fight against them. So the next day they went out again and fight, to fight against the men of Benjamin. But the men of Benjamin killed another 18,000 Israelites, all of whom were experienced with the sword. Go out and fight against them. Now, listen carefully, and I, I, want, I welcome your emails. I welcome your text. You won't even have to sign them. Isn't that sweet of me? But I, I'm going to be hair-splitting with you again. Once again, I want to say to you, even though he said, go out and fight against them, God didn't say when. He just said, go. He didn't say when. And they waited until evening. They prayed and they wept until evening. But they still got defeated. Are you beginning to see a double judgment taking place here? Are you beginning to see that God is having to judge Israel for their disobedience at the same time he's judging Benjamin, the Benjamites, for their apostasy, for their complete walking away from God. Let's go to the third prayer day. <laughs> then all the Israelites went up to Bethel and wept in the presence of the Lord and fasted until evening. Ah. They also brought burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord. These offerings had to do with sin. And communion. To break for their sin, to be sorrowful for their sin, and to have communion with the Lord. It's like a fellowship type offering of communion and, and make, to make things right with God. Mm. To make things right with God. God put the, put the halts on them. He stopped them. He put a hold on them. He forced them to stop and think and prepare to repent of their wrongdoing. Do you think we can keep on sinning in this world and be blessed? Do we think that we can keep on having all these victories and claim all kinds of victories and yet walk in disobedience to God? Folks, we're deceiving ourselves. There's a way that seemed right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Do we actually think I do I actually think I can walk out here today and walk in disobedience to God and expect that God's going to give me all the victories I ask for? Do I expect God to bless my life when I know that I'm not walking in obedience to Him? Who do I think I am? Why would we think that? <laughs> the Israelites went up seeking direction from the Lord. <laughs> now you're getting it. This time, the Israelites went up seeking the direction from the Lord. Because in those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was in Bethel. And Phinehas, son of Eleazar, and the grandson of Aaron was the priest. The Israelites asked the Lord, should we fight against our relatives from Benjamin again or should we stop? And the Lord said, go tomorrow. Didn't say that the first day. Tomorrow. Didn't say that the second day. Tomorrow. He said that the third day. Tomorrow, on the fourth day, you will go out against them. You, I will hand them over to you. Tomorrow, I will hand them over to you. To you. So what happened? Well, in the first one, God didn't say when. Nothing said about prep. God didn't say the second day when they should go, but they didn't weep until evening. 
But on that third day, <laughs> they wept, they fasted, they brought burnt offerings, they brought peace offerings, they asked God for directions, they asked God for how to do it. They spent time waiting in the presence of God for a long enough and enough time and asking the right questions, opening their heart in the right way, repenting of their sin in the right way, offering their communion and fellowship with the Lord the right way. And as a result, and then, and then only did they hear from the Lord. Tomorrow you will go out and I will hand them over to you. And guess what happened? Well, because it was clear, they went out and they won a great, great victory. So what is God doing? Well, he accepted the offerings of the Israelites for their disobedience. And he punished the Benjamites for their apostasy by destroying their soldiers and killing their men. Psalms 37, 7 says this. You don't have this in your notes, I don't believe. You might want to jot it down. But I would like you to look at verses 7 through 13 of Psalms 37. Psalms 37, 7 through 13. And as you write down Psalms 37, 7 through 13, I want you, if you believe the Bible is real, if you believe the Bible is true, if you believe the Bible still speaks today, I want you to read those scripture verses in light of what's going on in our country right now. I want you to read them. There are so many prophecies out there. There are so many visions out there. There are so many dreams out there. But let me tell you something. Look to the scripture to give you the answer. Don't look to man, but look to the scripture to give you the answer. Because if these visions and if these dreams and if these, these prophecies are not biblically based, then you need to set them aside and question their validity. But there's one thing we do not have to question today. We do not have to question the word of God. We need to but believe the word of God. We need but to trust the word of God. Amen? Psalms 37, 7 says this. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Right now, there are some schemes being carried out. Fret not. God is in control. He knows what he's doing. He knows what the plan is. And he's got a plan. And he knows the end result. Does it include the rapture right now? We don't know. It could. We don't know all the timing of everything. We just know that it's got to be getting closer and closer and closer. What you do is you keep your eyes on the Middle East. There's where you keep your eyes. You keep your eyes on the word. Keep your eyes in the word. Now, I close with these thoughts today. <sighs> Have you ever said to your spouse, Hon, are you just going to sit there? You just going to sit there and do nothing? You just going to sit there all day? You ever said to each other? You ever said that to your kids when the room isn't cleaned yet? Really? You just going to sit there? Sometimes those words can come back and haunt us. They came back and they haunted Martha one day. Here's what the scripture says in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening Sat at the Lord's feet listening. You go to the restaurant and you sit before the server. You don't go to the restaurant and they start serving you what they want to give you. Please see the simplicity of this. 
But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister, listen to these three words, just sits there. <laughs> These words came back and haunted Martha. She just sat in there, Lord. Honey, you just going to sit there all day? You ever, you've said that. Now that I'm retired, my wife has said that to me a few times. You just going to sit there? <laughs> Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits there while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, <laughs> you are worried and upset over all these details, over all these details. There's only one thing, and listen to these words of Jesus. Now, folks, I want you to put yourself today in your situation. I want you to think about all that's going on in our country, all that's going on in our world, all that's going on in the workplace, all that's going on in our home, all that's going on in life, all that's going on in our relationships, all that's going on in our family, all that's going on in our marriage, all that's going on in the chores, all that's going on in all the half-dudes of life, and all the dailies of life, and all of life. I want you to remember this one thing. Listen to what Jesus said. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. And that was this. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. What was it? What was it? What was the one thing worth being concerned about? That Mary was just sitting there. In the presence of Jesus. We've got all of our concerns on top of everything. And Jesus wants to be on the top. And he wants your concerns to be below you. And that the only concern we need to worry about today is doing the better thing. Martha wasn't wrong. She didn't commit a sin to be serving Jesus. She wasn't doing a sin to be preparing this meal. It's just that Jesus was saying to Martha at this time, at this time, Martha, don't misunderstand, Martha. You're not doing something sinful. But just at this time, Mary's doing the better thing. She's doing the thing that's more important. Ladies and gentlemen, we're living in an hour that the most important thing we could be doing right now, believe it or not, Believe it or not. And I'll let you fire at me with everything you've got. And I'll, I'll take the word of God and disprove everything you say. There's nothing more important right now in this world that we should be concerned about. Than making sure that in all that we do, we're just sitting there also in his presence. Connecting with God. Being close to God. Being in his presence. Ultimately, when you think about it, nothing is more important than taking time to know God. Why, folks? Because God knows all. Because God has a plan. And because God knows the end result. Therefore, we can put our trust in God today. And we can put our trust in his word. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father today, we are grateful for the example that you gave us through Mary that taught us the importance of just sitting in your presence. Lord, if we've got time to sit and watch TV, or sit and read a book, or sit and play a game, or set and scour the temperature in Japan, whatever, then we've certainly got time just to sit in your presence. 
that the greatest concern we should be concerned about is are we spending enough time with you to prepare us to know you and to prepare us for a future with things that are happening in our world today things that are happening in our country Lord Jesus we just turn it all over to you we turn it all over to you we turn it all over to you Lord we do our part we pray, we serve, we do wait on you. As we go about every day of our life waiting on you by serving you, by giving food and clothing to the poor and, uh, and the hungry and, and, and letting our light shine and being honest with our, our taxes and being honest with our work and doing everything we're supposed to do and walking in obedience to you, that's serving you. That's, that's, that's waiting on you. But then there's the sitting and waiting in your presence and stopping and just waiting before you, getting before you, kneeling before you, getting before you in your presence, and just absorbing your presence, listening to your voice, listening to the application of your word. And Lord, thank you that we have your word. It already tells us what to do. It already shows us what to do. And there are times we need to know the timing. There are times we need to know the how-tos, Lord. So, God, we submit ourselves to you. And I pray today, Lord, if there's anybody in this room or those online today into their homes, that, Jesus, they know they don't know you and they need you, that right now, by simply praying, Jesus, I need you. I want to know you. I want to experience you. I need you. I invite you into my life. I ask you to forgive me, Lord. And I invite you into my life. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I ask you to help me, Lord, to be who you'd have me to be. Lord, I just pray now that you'll encourage the heart of your people. And anybody would pray that prayer that, God, you would save them completely and fully to the uttermost. And you'll grow their lives. Lord, we just pray that you continue to watch over many of our people that are traveling. And, Lord, we just look forward to the day that we can just all return so, God, may we not lose desire, may we not lose interest, may we not lose our faithfulness, but may we remain faithful to you, Lord, and true to you, and walk in obedience to you. And thank you that you know all things. Thank you that you know the best way, and thank you that you know the end. And everyone prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.